is Selma Schimmel in Chicago at the annual ASCO meeting for the group room. Happy to be joined by Dr. David Quinn, medical director of the Norris Cancer Hospital, co-leader of the Genital Urinary Cancers Program for the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, head of the section of genital urinary medical oncology, associate professor of medicine in the Division of Cancer, Medicine, and Blood Diseases at the Keck School of Medicine at USC, which is in Southern California, our hometown. Good afternoon, Soma. How are you? How are you, Dr. Quinn? I'm very well, thank you. Could you give us a little bit of bladder cancer 101 and, and who's at greater risk and uh, gender as well? Traditionally, bladder cancer has been more common in, in men uh, by at least a ratio of, of two to one. There may be true sex differences in the incidence and, and uh, the uh, genesis of bladder cancer, but more likely that's due to risk factors. There are no known genetic risk factors that you can hand on from generation to generation for bladder cancer, so it's a little bit unique in that regard. But the, uh, the biggest risk factor relates to uh, smoking, and it's a latent effect. So the smoking that happened in the 60s, 70s and 80s uh, is now coming home to roost. Uh, and intersecting with the other big, big risk factor, which is age. As people get older, they're more likely to get bladder cancer. And so if you've got a cumulative exposure to tobacco over years, as you get older, uh, people are not dying of heart disease and other things, and they get to be old enough to, to get bladder cancer. Some of the more traditional industrial exposures uh, are, are now going away. Uh, manganese exposure in metal workers used to be an issue, but uh, after World War II, that's fairly uncommon. Uh, permanent hair dyes uh, in the old days used to be a risk factor, particularly for women. And there's a carcinogenic herb uh, from Taiwan uh, that was described by a Danish group in the, in the late 90s as uh, predisposing to bladder cancer, which now we don't see in Europe or the United States, but is available in some black markets in, in various other places. What is this herb? Astrologia uh, is, a, is a herb for, um, uh, for treating anxiety and, and uh, uh, helping with weight loss um, and uh, was, was widely used uh, throughout China in, in the, the 50s and 60s. Uh, in mainland China it's now relatively uncommon uh, and in Taiwan they, they uh, are having an active program to try and have it not sold. And you mentioned in environmental or workplace exposures, uh, cadmium. Cadmium, yeah. So cadmium and manganese used to be a, a, an issue for, for people who worked in the smelting industry. Uh, but one of the, uh, the good byproducts of World War II and some of the changes that occurred after World War II where uh, nations had to produce things for war, often made of metal, was that the, the uh, occupational health and safety improved and our knowledge of toxicology improved so that uh, we began to identify these things uh, in people that worked in those industries. The other area that probably is worth mentioning, and women are really, this is common for women, is that, you know, not going uh, to the restroom and holding their bladder. And I have learned that it's very important to not hold your bladder and to regularly go to the restroom, is this true? We, we know that the more urine flow you get, the less chance you have of having bladder cancer. Now it depends on how big your natural bladder is and what you can retain, and that varies from one person to another. Women do tend to have smaller bladders, uh, and so from, from that perspective, I, I guess we're not encouraging them to stretch their bladders. And so there is reason to drink water, uh, a lot of water, in order to flush the bladder. That's right, it's, it's a good habit to get into. How is bladder cancer typically treated and how is it diagnosed? Most people presenting with bladder cancer have blood in their urine. Uh, it's either uh, blood that they can see or blood that's picked up when they have a test with their doctor, which is often done annually. Um, and in the old days we used to do a dipstick of that mm -hmm. and it would detect blood in microscopic amounts. Uh, now it gets sent off to a, a lab and it gets done for a variety of reasons. We've altered that approach, better accuracy. So that um, a person uh, beyond the age of 50 uh, who has blood in, in their urine has about a one in eight chance of having bladder cancer. 
The good news is that if you get bladder cancer early and it's superficial and low grade, it uh, can be treated with a local treatment and uh, some therapy into the bladder, usually something called BCG, which is the old tuberculin vaccine that produces an inflammatory reaction and many of the patients can do very well and it does not progress to become a potentially fatal uh, cancer. Uh, so it's more of a nuisance. Um, for patients that have higher grade disease, that can also be superficial, so it's just like in the inner lining of the bladder. And uh, that produces uh, more of a problem in terms of follow-up because uh, we know that it can be more aggressive uh, and has the potential to go through the inner lining of the bladder into the muscle layer and then to spread further, uh, particularly over time. And at that point, uh, the cancer becomes extremely dangerous. And we have a discussion with the patients about whether they should have definitive therapy and have their bladder removed surgically, uh, or whether they should have a combination of uh, chemotherapy intravenously uh, with radiation therapy uh, to treat uh, their bladder cancer. Unfortunately, the most advanced stage is where the cancer spreads and uh, it will often spread to lymph nodes in the lung, but can also spread to the, the brain and bone and liver. And those last three organs are very serious situations. Um, despite those serious situations, uh, if patients have a good response to chemotherapy, there is still a, a low uh, but reproducible cure rate of somewhere between 10 and 15%. Um, what that means is it's good news for a small proportion of patients that get to that stage. Uh, for the majority of patients who, who make up 85 or 90 percent, it, it's, it's then a fatal illness. Thank you so much, Dr. David Quinn, Medical Director, Norris Cancer Hospital, co-leader of the Genitourinary Cancers Program from the USC Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center, head of the section of Genitourinary Medical Oncology, and Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cancer Medicine and Blood Diseases Keck School of Medicine. Thank you, Soma. Pleasure.